I learned a little bit about Milk Call recently. Let's talk about him. A lot of people know him as a renowned animator and a Disney legend. What I don't think a lot of people know is that he held impossibly high standards for his employees and discouraged a lot of artists from pursuing their own styles and dreams. In 2017, D23 released a video discussing Milk Call's talents and the negative impact he had on his co-workers. Because Walt Disney knew that he was the top draftsman and he can make these characters look just the way they should look, like very, very polished. But Milk Call knew that and often didn't have any patience for bad drawing. And more than once, an animator or an, an assistant would come into Milk's room and have drawings checked and he would just throw the drawing down the hall the whole scene and say, we don't even draw like that around here. I want to go back and analyze what I believe his name was Andreas, or Mr. Deha, said there in the video a little bit more. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. He said Milk Call didn't have a tolerance for bad drawings, which is a relative term, but it's one that leaves a bit of a sour taste in my mouth to even perpetuate. I mean, Disney is supposedly supposed to be a place that perpetuates magic and their blue sky motto says that everything starts with an idea. It's supposed to encourage creativity in the pursuit of dreams and yet a man who was harshly criticizing, not even constructively, his fellow animators was so constantly left in charge of major scale projects like this. The first time I heard about this, I was honestly stunned. I'd say that I made them so nervous they couldn't work and all that stuff, you know. You know, kind of picking at them all the time. Well, you just had high standards that not a lot of people could meet. Sure, that's right, that's right, that's right. Well, it's not only and that. You might as well, geez, if you don't have, if you don't have something to aspire to, well, what have you got, you know? You have to have high standards. I think that's part of a, uh, uh, I think that's part of any any profession. You have to. You, God, if you don't if you don't aim high, well, you're not going to get anywhere. You know. What about live action reference in general, though? How how is that? I think I think it's uh, I think if you're going to use human characters, I think it's necessary, and I I, I don't approve approve of it, but. Uh, I, I still, uh, it depends. Uh, if 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 you had, if everybody on the picture was a milk cow, well, and you wouldn't, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be necessary. It wouldn't be necessary to, to use live action reference, but unfortunately, uh, they aren't, and it, it is necessary. He consistently prioritized his standards over the comfort and growth of his employees, and oftentimes wouldn't even allow them to line his work because he was so certain that his art style was the right way and that there was nothing that could possibly be added to it. He frowned upon using references because that's not what he would do. And this is more of a personal tangent than anything, but I honestly say use references. I think it's a pleasure to be able to use references and to learn from them because when you close your mind off to new ideas both from co-workers from friends from references you close your mind off to forming new ideas and honestly i personally believe that if he would have listened to his co-workers that he could have grown as an artist too as far as he was known as a disney legend i honestly think everyone can grow in art and that all good art should come from a place of love not from hatred and certainly not from a place of prioritizing standards over the comfort of people i want to talk a little bit about the jungle book now um the 1967 disney movie based on the rudyard kipling i don't know how to pronounce names uh novel um and a little bit of research that I did and the way that I was able to improve with my art personally by adding my own touches to some of the character designs that 
he started and learning by continuing to use references instead of closing my mind off to them completely. The original movie um, didn't exactly... It wasn't heavily dependent on the book, but I do enjoy the book and I feel like a lot of the characters were true to the book despite the plotline taking a slightly different direction. Um, but something that really struck my attention, I'm going to be honest, I'm really biased. Bagheera is my favorite character. He's the one I've been doing studies on. I've been looking into um, all sorts of stuff about leopards. Um, he's a melanistic Indian leopard. And um, I found, first of all, the first place I looked was his introduction in the book. Um, I don't remember the quote exactly, but I'll put it on the screen. It said something like that his fur flitted in and out of sunlight like watered silk with uh, the rosettes of his spots, which I thought was interesting. And I've seen in early drafts that they were going to give him spots. I'm guessing the reason they didn't is because it was too difficult to animate, which I also think is funny because... You know, surely if Milk Call was the best of the best, he could have pulled it off, but I mean, who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm not, just, just to be very clear, I'm not making this video to try to say that I am attempting to compete with him artistically. I'm actually making this video to actually pretty much say that competing with people artistically defeats the purpose of art. Art should come from a place of love and should be made in collaboration, not competition. Art isn't something that you need to technically master, in my opinion. It's something that takes the ideas in your brain and puts them down onto paper. And The Jungle Book is such a comfort movie to me. All iterations of it, really. I mean, I enjoyed the 1967 movie perhaps the most, along with the original book, the most. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of this time to share the love that I have received from that novel and from learning about leopards and referencing references instead of trying to angle every line and critiquing myself when it didn't end up exactly like milk calls on the first try instead of bashing myself for needing to use references I learned about different fur patterns in leopards. I've learned that there are different subspecies and that they all differ a little bit. I feel like the more you look at something, the more you learn. And as people, curious-minded people, we never stop learning. And that's a good thing. It'll allow us to keep improving. Um, I wanna share a little drawing I did with you guys. Um, <laughs> about all the stuff that I found. Uh, I've been using live action references, which is something that he advised to do with animals, but frowned upon doing with humans, which I think was silly. Um, instead of trying to pack as much as I could possibly pack into my mind at once, I've been looking at the references leisurely and doodling small doodles in my spare time and detailing with as many supplemental references as possible. Something I found out that's very interesting about melanistic leopards too is that they're not entirely just black. They're like a dark brown. Like, I don't know if you've ever known anyone with dark brown hair. I happen to have dark brown hair. It looks black at some angles, but in the sun, you can see that it's actually dark brown. It's kind of the same with leopards, and when you see that, like, brown glint, you can also see the rosettes of the leopard um, shining through in the light, as the book described. Um, and um, another thing is that leopards are very small compared to other types of um, big cats. Um, they look really similar to jaguars, and the difference between them is that jaguars have a spot in the middle of their rosettes 
they have they're built in a stockier way um they're also jaguars have shorter fur compared to leopards and i found that leopards need longer fur to protect themselves evolutionarily i'm also a biology nerd so i apologize for this ramble but i feel like it is still related because it just goes to show you how deep love should run when you make art but anyway <laughs> Leopards are agile, they stay in the trees. I think Figura's character is really true to that, being agile, cautious, and um, staying away from danger when possible. Not that all leopards are the same. I've seen some leopards that are extremely playful, and I found that um, playful leopards will turn over and show their stomachs to the people they trust, which I think is really interesting too. I also think it's a testament to Figura's character that he never did that in the movie because he's a very cautious and guarded leopard and character but um oh right I said I was gonna show my drawing and then I never did I just wanted to highlight all of those differences first so I could talk about why I made the artistic choices that I did and then um I've been stalling for long enough <laughs> this is my iteration of Bagheera um based on the way that he looks in the movie but also by using live-action references! Um, I'll show the reference picture I used for it right here, real quick. So, um, I wanted to highlight the fact that the underbelly and chest had lighter and more dense fur, because um, these animals need basically a primordial pouch, which is basically a fancy way of saying they need their organs protected so they can be less vulnerable to being attacked um they kill their prey by delivering um a bite to the neck essentially whereas jaguars have very powerful jowls and they can just crush skulls but leopards since they're smaller they need to be more clever which i also think is a testament to figure's character it was a really good idea for the original author to make him a leopard in my opinion and I think that the writing of the 1967 movie also highlights that really well. But, um, other design choices! The spots only really show up in the light, so I wanted to highlight the fact that the darker areas, the spots don't show up as well, but on the stomach, um, they show up a bit better because it's lighter. And the areas closer to the stomach, you can see them more clearly. I wanted to highlight the direction of fur, which you... I feel like it would be very difficult to memorize the direction fur goes without using references. Um, if I could get it to load there. Um, like the way the fur goes around the eyes, around the snout. Um, I used the little nose lines that I was trying to figure out why he had input in there for some of his animations, but um, yeah, it like scrunches around the eyes a little. Um, I like the design choice of the ears being rounded too. But um, paws are another thing that you can't really... Well, I feel like it's important to use references just to know the way that they bend. And another thing I used was skeletal references. They're extremely important because um, the way... Hang on, I remember the name of this. Okay, I found it. Their feet are called digitigrade feet, which is something I also learned in class. Um, they basically walk on their tiptoes, um, which is something that I also benefit from studying references. Um, I think it definitely is nice to be able to, I guess, draw these sorts of things without references, but I feel like I would miss little details that I wouldn't have caught the first times, like the fact that in a feline skeleton, you know, the shoulder blades, they perk out and then go in like that, and they're kind of like rhombus shaped. Um, the way the joints like go like that, I mean, I feel like you could get the general direction just fine, but at least personally, I benefit from using references and that's not a bad thing. I mean, I know for a fact that I know which way whiskers go, but I wouldn't have remembered that they curved slightly this way at this angle or slightly the other way at another angle. You can guess, 
and that is a nice ability to have, but I, I personally think it will always be nice to be able to use references to enrich your understanding of what you see. You know, when you find poses that you can use references for, um, this is basically an excuse to show off my art. <laughs> Again, I don't want to say that, like, I'm not doing this in a competitive way. I want to see your guys' drawings too, you know? Art that comes from a place of love in my heart will always be something that means something. I want to hear about your passions and why you draw what you draw. I, I think it's sad that a lot of people draw to perfect their art and then demean others about it. I, I've i never seen art as that. I've seen art as a way to express the love you have in your heart onto paper. So thank you for letting me show off my art and for listening to this video. Um, I hope that you know that you can do anything you set your mind to. And I'm not saying that just to be blindly optimistic. I mean, it's important to go at your own pace and to be patient with yourself, to learn in a way that is good for you, no matter what anyone else says, even if there's someone who's supposedly a higher up. Your process is your process, your life is your life, and your pace is your pace. And whatever you need to do to get where you want to go, go for it, do it, update me along the way. I know you're going to go out and do wonderful things. Just make sure to stop and breathe, and I found an excellent Tumblr post that I think would be great to close off this video with. Okay, I lied, it was a tweet. Um, it's essentially saying, be like Kermit the Frog. Have creative drive, have passion, have love, and don't let an ego get in the way of it because we work better together than we ever will apart. Thanks for watching.